The title of this message, the last in a series about favor called Ultimate Favor, Ultimate Favor. Father, I thank you for your power, for your life, for your victory. I thank you that you give words of life to your messengers. So I pray, Lord, for fire words today. In, in, in the midst of, of a, a generation where it's easy to get distracted, and it's easy to get just off center a little bit. It's easy to, to not be wholehearted towards you, Jesus. So let these words ultimately bring us back to the fullness that you have for us. We thank you for this in Jesus' name. And everybody said amen. 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 Turn with me in your scriptures to Exodus chapter 33. Exodus chapter 33. I want to read verse 3 and then skip to verse 12 and read through towards the end of the chapter. There, Verse 3 says, this is Moses and God having a conversation. Go up to the land, God says to Moses. Go up to a land flowing with milk and Honey. Now, these must have been amazing words, you would think, after 40 years of wandering in the wilderness, after escaping from the bondage and slavery, his people, generation after generation, for 400 years being bound to slavery in, his, in Egypt, and now they're getting set free, and they've been longing to go into this land of milk and honey. Twelve spies had been previously, 40 years earlier, had, had uh, checked out the land, and they said that it was too difficult, there was too many enemies in the land, we couldn't take it, even though it had uh, grapes that were too large to carry, it had all these difficulties to try to surpass as well. So they didn't go in. Now God finally speaks to Moses and says, go up to a land flowing with milk and honey. But look at these words. But I will not go up among you, lest I consume you on the way, for you are a stiff-necked people. And then skipping on to verse 12. And Moses said to the Lord, see, you say to me, bring up this people, but you have not let me know who you would send with me. You have said, I know you by name, and, I, and you have also found favor in my sight. Now, therefore, if I have found favor in your sight, please show me now your ways that I might know you in order to find favor in your sight. <clears throat> Consider, too, that this is your, nation is your people. And he said, my presence will go with you and I will give you rest. And he said to him, if your presence will not go with me, do not bring us up from here. For how shall it be known that I have found favor in your sight, I and your people? Is it not in your, in going with, your going with us that, so that we are distinct, I and your people, from every other people on the face of the earth? So the Lord said to Moses, this very thing that you have spoken I will do, for you have found favor in my sight, and I know you by name. Moses said, please show me your glory. And he said, I will make my goodness pass before you and will proclaim before you my name, the Lord. And I will be gracious to whom I will be gracious and I will show mercy on whom I will show mercy. But he said, you cannot see my face for man shall not see me and live. And the Lord said, behold, there is a place by me where you shall stand on the rock. And while my glory passes by, I will put you in the cleft of the rock and I will cover you with my hand until I have passed by. Then I will take away my hand and you shall see my back, but my face you shall not see. This morning, I wanna give glory and honor to God for his unlimited favor upon his children. I wanna honor him for answering the prayers and the cries of our heart, for restoring marriages that have been broken apart, for healing bodies that have been sick and broken. I, Received a short little video. I shared the testimony of a little boy named Isaiah who was born. The doctors didn't even think he'd live 10 days and he couldn't walk. And his mom heard me preaching about that. She sent me a video of him at a wedding. And he's, he's a yay high and he's dancing with a little girl, his first dance. It's amazing when we see the favor of God on families like that. When you see the favor of God on like a young man named Chad who came here and had been in many difficult circumstances in his life and, and been uh, beaten down by people and for him to catch on how much God loves him, the favor of God is on his life, that he finally realized it. He said Sunday, like something snapped and he realized it and he was freed up. He had been a Christian, but he got freed up to actually get in the baptism tank for the first time in his life. That's the favor of God, isn't it? And all of us in this room know and are grateful and are thankful for the favor of God. We know that he has blessed us with a, a unmerited favor. He has, uh, he, he, has, he has done things in our life that we couldn't imagine. He's, he's healed our, all of our diseases. He has touched us in ways that we just can't comprehend. And it's a, it is a great thing to be able to proclaim the favor of the Lord. It is a great thing to be able to receive 
not only the teaching of the favor of the Lord, but actually experience the favor of the Lord in your marriages, in your finances, in your home, on your job, in your neighborhood, in your church, in your school, in your education, in your marriage, in your relationships. It's, it's just amazing to see the favor of God. I, I want to call that, if I could, the unlimited favor of God. It just seems to have no boundaries that his favor is so grand in our lives. But I want to speak to you this morning not about unlimited favor of how he touches our marriages and our heals our bodies and fix uh, his difficult relationships that we might be going through and helps us on our job when we're having a difficult time and releases finances when we're in crisis. Uh, yes, that might be wonderful and that might be called unlimited favor, but I don't want to talk to you today about unlimited favor. I want to talk to you today about ultimate favor. Because there is a favor that is even better than unlimited favor. There is a favor, and you may look at me strange for a moment here, but let, hold on and, and try to listen. There's a favor that's better than your marriage getting healed. There's a favor that's better than your body getting healed. There's a favor better than the finances breakthrough uh, in your life when you're in need. There's a favor that's better than you getting uh, the house you've been crying out for, praying for, or the new car. There's a favor that's better than uh, uh, you feeling better about yourself, overcoming discouragement and doubt and fear. There's a favor that is an, uh, an ultimate favor. It is the favor of God, and it's found not in what God does for us, but who God is. The, the ultimate favor is God himself. The ultimate favor is, is, is not a thing, it's a him. Yeah. He, he is the ultimate favor. And that's what Moses is saying here in this intercession that he has. Lord, you're saying I can go up and I can have milk and honey and grapes are too big to carry and we can have this ultimate, uh, excuse me, this unlimited favor of God in a land that is plentiful and rivers flow through it and it's like a garden of Eden. I can have all that and bring all my people in after 40 years of, of holding on for that and wanting that and longing for that and desiring that. I can finally have it. And now Moses says, no. I, I don't want it. I don't want to go to a place that has all that but doesn't have you. And there are many people that, that, that uh, I think it was C.S. Lewis asked this question. If you could have everything you ever wanted, all your dreams come true, every aspiration, every desire come to reality, and you could have that in heaven, but God wouldn't be there, would you go? Or, or would you rather have all that stuff stripped away and say, I'll be there in the presence of God? That's ultimate favor. And it's not putting down or it's not distracting from or taking away from the, the generosity of a loving God who cares for his children and wants to bless and bring the, the unlimited favor of his love and grace upon us. But it's, it's a higher kind of favor. It's the favor of his actual presence in our heart, in our life. It's a, it's a favor that's, that's not found in, in, in anything that he could do, but it's found in his great and glorious and majestic and wonderful and awesome and awe-inspiring and other, uh, the otherness of God that, that he would take all that of who he is and say, I want to reveal that to you. I, I, come and know me. Come and be a friend of God. Come and walk with me. Come and let the Spirit of God fall on you. Come and see my glory. Oh, there's nothing greater than that. Everything that I've spoke of in this past few months is important and we need to, to take it into our heart and into our account and our life and keep praying and keep believing and pre keep proclaiming like we talked about last Sunday. But there is an encouragement from the Holy Spirit here this morning to go one step further and say, thank you for all those things. But more importantly, God, just give me yourself. Give me the honor of knowing you. Give me the honor of walking with you. We are, we are truly and deeply grateful for the favor that brings us our daily bread, but the crumbs of the table of daily bread pale in comparison to the grandeur and the glory of knowing God, of seeing his face, of seeking his glory, of having his presence, of having that, the weightiness of God in our heart and our life. And I'm afraid that too many of us, when we hear about God's favor, we, we take it as, as we should and say, yes, God, thank you for your favor. But then we stop there and say, as long as I have that, I have enough. But it's not enough. It's not enough. You can have the greatest marriage and the greatest home and the greatest job and the greatest kids and the, uh, the greatest physical body, the greatest condition your physical body's ever been in your life. And you can have every relationship of everybody that's giving you favor. But if Jesus is in the middle of it, you have nothing at all. You have nothing at all. And I'm afraid that there are many churches that get stuck on the first part, unlimited favor. And we need to be careful ourselves that we don't get so... Uh, desirous of unlimited favor alone that we miss out on the ultimate favor of he is here. God is here. Hallelujah. God is here and he's in our midst today. Exodus 33, as we're reading here, is Moses' words, he keeps saying this, if I found favor, but he's not asking for the favor of the land of milk and honey. He's saying, if I found favor, 
don't take me to those things if you're not going with me in those things. I don't mind those things. I want to be, and God wanted them to be in the land of milk and honey. You see, there's, there's almost a polarized view in, in, in churches today. One is it's, it's all about the unlimited favor. Let's get all we get, get from God. He's almost like a genie. We rub the, the magic lantern and we try to get things from him. And there's the other side of this. It's like, it's kind of a morbid. And, you know, if you want anything for yourself, you're a dirty, rotten, no good sinner. And, and, no, and God wants you to have desires. And he wants them to, he wants Israel, he actually wants them to go into the land of milk and honey. And, and up to this time, he wanted to go with them, but now he could not abide with them. You know why? Because you remember the story, it was the golden calf that they put together when Moses tarried up on the mountain when he was in the presence of God. They couldn't bear with that. And so they built an idol for themselves. And this idol was something that they began to worship. And you see the shift here from the unlimited favor. We have all these favors of God. We have the water coming out of the rock. We have manna coming from heaven. We have a cloud in front of us that leads us uh, in the daytime and a pillar of fire that leads us in the night. We have everything unlimited that we want. But when you get to the place where you're willing to have all that without God, you end up building an idol. You build an idol of, and, and today it's not water out of a rock because we have it out of a tap. We don't have to cry out to God for that. Bread is delivered or you can go to the grocery store. The things that we build as our golden calf today are more things out of our career and our job and our aspirations and our own desires and our own ambitions and our own dreams and our own uh, schemes that we would try to build a, a, a golden calf that we could make and worship that. We worship, uh, you actually, your heart is given towards anything that you love more than you love God is an idol. And we give ourselves to those things. I, I just so badly want success. I so badly want to be famous. I so badly want uh, security. I, and, and whatever that thing you want, if you want it more than you want God, you're missing out on God. You've built an idol. And then God says, in that idolatry, I will not go with you into these things that you're longing for. They're not bad things. A good family is not a bad thing. Blessing and prosperity is not a bad thing. But if you make an idol out of that, he says, I, I, just, I choose not to go with you and, and I love Moses' heart cry. Don't you love that? I, I am not going without you. Kill me in the desert before you take me into a prosperous land and you not be there with us. And I pray that that's the cry of our church here. I pray that's the cry of your heart. I pray there's a hunger. And if there's not a hunger, I pray that today, before this day is over, there's a, a renewing of that hunger, a stirring of that hunger in your heart that says, man, I, I, I've kind of slipped away from this. I've kind of missed, missed, missed out on this. I'm getting misdirected, misguided. My eyes are getting more on the unlimited favor of God, but not the ultimate favor of God. I'm getting more into the things he can do for me and not just simply knowing him for who he is. I want to ask you this question this morning. Is God enough for you? Does he satisfy the longing of your heart? Is, is he sufficient for you? Is there some other thing in your life that if he says, I'm not going with you on that, you'll still want to go into that. I'll, you know, okay, God, you're not going to go with me to success, but I'm still going to go. I'll call on your name a little bit every once in a while just so I can stay Christianized, but, but God, uh, I'm still willing to go. Is there anywhere you would forge ahead into things if God were saying, I'm not going with you in that because you're putting them ahead of me? That's the first commandment. Have no other God before me. Don't let success, fame, comfort, uh, power, authority, recognition, money, don't let any of those things come before me because if you do, you'll have favor on your life to some degree, but not ultimate favor. In verse 22, it says here, look at this, let's go back there one more time. Verse 22, and while my glory passes by, I will hide you in the cleft of the rock. I will cover you with my hand until I have passed by. This is so precious. God says to Moses, okay, you want my glory? Thank you. Uh, I've been looking for people that want me for me. You know, you know, can you imagine a marriage that somebody wants you just for the things you can do for them? Marry into a rich family, get a hot woman, you know, things that they can do. And, and, and here's God's, I think he's hardest for Moses saying, thank you for wanting me just for who I am. Have you ever had a child, uh, you know, that, you know, kids ask for things, right? Dad, can I have this? Dad, will you give me that? Dad, can I have this? But do you ever have a child? I've had this happen in my life many times where my children have said to me, Dad, I know you do a lot for me, but I just want you to know I love you just for who you are. Man, that nothing warms the heart like that. And the same things with our father as well. Moses says to him, I just, just, just the glory's good. Land, land milk and honey, I'm, I'm, I'm willing to go as long as you're there, but, but what I really want is your glory. And God says something amazing here. He says, okay, I can't show you my face, 
I can show you where I've been. I can walk through and, and you'll see where. And the Hebrew there is, it's, it's, yes, it is the back he's showing, but it's more than just the back. It's like when I walk through, I, my presence co- goes behind me. It, it lingers. Uh, you can see my goodness. You can see the good things. There's a trail I leave behind of goodness. And I'll show you that, Moses. But I'm going to hide you in the cleft of the rock and I'm going to cover you with my hand so that you don't see the other part of my goodness. You'll see the goodness of the favor of the Lord and the kindness of the Lord. But Moses, I can't show you my holiness or I'll kill you. I can't show you my awe or you'll die of a heart attack. I can't show you what the Bible says in the New Testament is God living in unapproachable light. I can't show you the, the terror of the Lord. I can't show you the, the, the ultimate fear of God when people ask that question, what is the fear of God? Is it to be afraid of him? And we try to disguise it and say, no, don't be afraid of God. Be afraid of God. He, he, he can be a terror if he wants to. And I know, I know our thinking today is in the Old Testament, he was a terror. And then Jesus came along and said, be nice, dad. You're being so mean. Come on, let me take over for a while and we'll show people what nice is. And, and then later on, Jesus is gonna take a step back and God's gonna come again in his wrath and his judgment in the last days. When, when, when he, no, but in the last days, it's Jesus coming with a sword on his side, with a tattoo on his hip, with his, with his robe dipped in blood. That's what the Bible describes him. And so there's a fierceness of God. C.S. Lewis wrote that so well when he wrote the character of Aslan, when little, I think it was Lucy, coming up to him, says, are you safe? And he says, I'm good, but I'm not safe. And, and, and please don't hear me saying there should be a, uh, a fear of God like you would an abusive father. It's not that type of fear, but it's a, a reverence for him, right? It's a, he's other than us, and I better pay attention to him. He's more than us, and I better humble myself before him. He is more awesome than anything I've seen, experienced, or known, so I should bow and humble myself at his feet. And that's the, that's the fear of the Lord. That's what Moses, God says to him, I, I can't quite show you that yet, I'll, I'll show you the good parts of me, but the other part, I'm going to hide you in the cleft of a rock, in a cleft of a rock. It's very important. Turn with me, if you would, in your scriptures to 1 Corinthians chapter 10. 1 Corinthians chapter 10. You probably are familiar with this scripture. It's pretty well known. 1 Corinthians chapter 10. And it speaks of this rock that Moses was speaking of. It's, it's, it's Paul literally speaking of this experience that we've just read from. 1 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 4. It's, let me back up and I'll, I'll read verse 1. I don't think I have it on the screen, but uh, I'll read 1, 2, and 3, and then verse 4 should be on the screen. Uh, For I do not want you to be unaware, brothers, that our fathers were all under the cloud and all passed through the sea and all were baptized in the Moses and the cloud and the sea and all ate the spirit, same spiritual food and all drank the same spiritual drink. Interesting, look at me for just a moment. They, in other words, they all had unlimited favor. They all experienced everywhere they went and everything they did, they experienced this favor. They all had the cloud. They all had the rock. They all had the water. They all had the manna from heaven. Uh, And then he says what that was in verse four, and they all drank from the same spiritual drink. They drank from the same spiritual rock that followed them. And praise God, this is powerful. And that rock was Christ. That rock was Christ. Oh, if you'll catch on to that and understand what that means, it will change your perception of God. First thing I want to bring to your attention there is that in the Old Testament, God said to Moses, I'm going to let you see some of my goodness, but you can't really see all of my, you can't really experience me face to face. You can't walk in my holiness. You're, you're, you're not built. You're still walking under the law, not the regeneration of a life that can become holy in God. So, so you're separate from God and you can't see God. So I'm going to hide you in the cleft of the rock. And then Paul looks back on that experience. You know what he says? That rock was Christ. That rock was Christ. I'm going to hide you in Christ. In other words, all those people, even before, here's the mercy and love of God. Here's the goodness that he's showing. Even before there was ever a cross, even before the blood of Jesus Christ was shed for the remission of our sin, even before there was, was the, the Isaiah 53, that I think it is, that, uh, you know, that, that uh, uh, by his stripes we are healed. All be, even before all of that took place, even though Christ had not even come yet, God says, 
the coming of Christ and the work of Christ on the cross and the victory of Christ and resurrection is going to be so powerful that not only will people in the New Testament times look back to what Jesus has done for us, but people in the Old Testament times could look forward to what Jesus is going to do for them. And you'll be saved by the goodness of God, by hiding in that rock. I'm going to hold you in that place of that rock and then I'm going to cover you with my hand. You won't see all the glory because it'll kill you. Oh, but in 1 Corinthians, uh, in 2 Corinthians uh, Go to 2 Corinthians, if you will, too. I know we're turning around to a lot of scriptures. Uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 3. 2 Corinthians chapter 3. We're going to read from verse, uh, I believe, 13, 13 through 15. Um, uh, not like Moses, who would put a veil over his face so that the Israelites may not glaze on the outcome of what was being brought to an end. So Moses had been and he'd seen the glory of God. He'd seen... The, 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 the goodness of God passed through. He was hid in the cleft of the rock. And says, but their minds were hardened for this day when they read the old covenant, the same veil remains unlifted because only through Christ is it taken away. Yes, to this day, whenever Moses is read, a veil lies over their hearts. But when one turns to the Lord, the veil is removed. Now where the Lord is, is the spirit and the spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. And we with unveiled face beholding what? the glory of the Lord are being transformed into the same image from one degree to another for this comes from the Lord who is spirit. This is so good news for us here who live in the new covenant because we're not like Moses who are having to hide in the rock. The rock has been fully exposed to us. Christ is that rock. Uh, we're not waiting for water to come out of it. The water has been poured out. Rivers of, Jesus said, rivers of living water flow out of me. What's coming now is, is in this generation that we live is this ultimate favor of God. He's, the ultimate favor of God is not in, in our cars and our houses and our health, ultimately. Those are good things, but really where our ultimate faith and our ultimate uh, favor lies is in the fact that not like Moses with a veiled face, not like the children of Israel, not like uh, Abraham, Isaac, or Jacob, not like Daniel, not like David, we have in this generation those long to look into what we have today. And what is it? That that rock has been exposed to us, that the hand of God that covered us from seeing, the beholding the glory of God, God has now removed that hand and said, the blood makes you sufficient now to come into the very presence of God, into the holy of holies, into the, into the very presence of a living God, and that he could be known in the fullness of his glory, not just in his goodness, but we can know the awesomeness of God. We can know the trembling, the, the part of God that makes us tremble and still say, God, in fear and in awe and in reverence, I bow before you because I give thanks for your goodness, for your graciousness. This is the goodness of God being revealed in fullness. You have more than Moses had. We look back and I, man, I admire Moses and I admire David and I admire Joshua and, and Caleb, but, but when I read this stuff in the New Testament, I say, man, just Jesus said it about John the Baptist. The, the least in the kingdom of God is greater than even John the Baptist. He wasn't talking about stronger or better preacher, more prophetic. He was talking about a greater revelation. We have access to a greater revelation. Let me ask you another question. Do you seek this revelation? Where's your time, energy spent? Where's your longing of your heart spent? Where's the seeking of, of what, what, what face do you seek? Do you seek the face of your idol or do you seek the face of God? And, 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 and let that be the heart cry as we leave here in just a few moments saying, God, what am I really seeking? Who am I really serving? What am I really out for? Why do I really acknowledge you as my Lord? Is it so that you could give me unlimited favor and do things for me? Or is it to say to God, even if you slay me, yet I will praise you? Could you say to God, strip away the healthy marriage that I long for? Take me out of the home that I love living in? Have them repossess my car? Cause my body to break down where I can hardly move or walk anymore? And yet still in this pounding heart will be a cry saying out to God, you're mine and I love you. I behold your glory and it is sufficient for me. Your glory is enough. That's all I long for. That's all I want. Oh, it's hard to say. It's hard to say, oh, and I thank God in his goodness. You don't have to choose one or the other. He, he, in his graciousness, he, 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 you seek first the kingdom of God and he adds other things to you. But there has to be that priority in our life. There has to be that first in our life. He didn't say, seek God, uh, you know, and then other things will happen. He says, seek first. Put it in first priority. And here's this ultimate favor. God no longer hitting. God no longer covering his, hand with a veil, covering his face with a veil or his hand. We get to behold his glory. We get to see his favor is, 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 is there for us. 
the last few things I want to share with you goes back to Moses again and, and this idea of what the rock has done for us, what Christ the rock has done for us, other than the, the water coming out, uh, other than revealing of the glory. There's one last thing I want to share there that just so blesses my heart about this. We won't turn there, but if you were to go back, if you were still in Exodus, we were in Exodus 33. If you go back to, say, Exodus 17, for instance, 16, 14, 15, 16, 17, there's these stories about their hunger and their thirst. They, want, they don't have enough uh, uh, to eat, and they, want, and they grumble and they complain. They actually, some scholars say, they actually put, put food and water as an idol. And how do we know this is because they, they were so willing to reject God for that thing. Whenever you're willing to turn your face from God for something else, it shows there's an idol in your heart. Uh, maybe a better way to say it is not on that way, but to say anything in your heart that if you don't get it, you're going to be hurt over it, you're going to be broken over it, you're going, to dis- you're, going to, you're going to get bitter over it, you're going to be depressed and discouraged if you don't get it. Anything like that, then it's probably formed into an idol that's equal to God. Those things are meant to be lesser. They're yes to be pursuits in our life, but secondary to God. And what's happening, the children of Israel were starting to put all these, all these things that they had in Egypt, remember? We had food plenty. We had water available to us in the wells there. We had safety. We had security. We had homes to live in. And there's this constant cry of the, of the people who are living now in a bitterness because God is withholding something from them. And really what they want from God is the stuff from him and not him. And so they want water and they're not getting it. And so they begin to murmur and grumble and complain. One place is called the waters of bitterness. It wasn't that the waters were bitter alone. It was the fact that their hearts were bitter. I don't have what I want. God, you're supposed to give me what I want. You're supposed to, uh, the, and water in the New Testament and the Old represents longings of our heart. It represents deep thirsts, uh, desires that if we're not careful, if we put them ahead of God, they could be good things. It could be a great marriage you want or a great job. If you put them ahead of God, they become an idol. And then you know if it's an idol because if, if it's taken away, if, if, the, if the ideal job is taken away, if the ideal spouse is taken away, if the ideal uh, physical condition of your body is taken away, do you still have the Moses cry, show me your glory? It's enough. It's sufficient. And so if it's taken away and if you're in that bitterness, and that's why they call this place where the water's where they couldn't drink the water, it was, it was a place of bitterness for them. And they got so bitter that the Old Testament says that they tested God and they began to um, not only murmur and complain, but bring an argument against God. And that's in chapter 17, 16 and 17. And when you see that argument against God, you know what you see in there? The Hebrew word, I was listening to uh, one of the, somebody uh, talking about this word this week and, and, and it comes to mean not just attesting God or not just uh, accusing God. It's, it's actually a trial word, a word that you use in trial, that you're brought, under, you're brought to a trial. You're brought to an accusation is made against you, a legal accusation. The people of Israel brought a legal accusation against not only Moses, but against God. And the accusation was that you're not good, that you're not for us, that you're not with us. And the accusation was, was, and strangely enough, it was an accusation that they, they were the, 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 the judge and jury. So they tried the case. Is God good? Is he on our side? Is he for us and not against us? Is he giving us the, really, the idols of our heart? And he wasn't giving them the idols of the heart. He was testing them to see if their heart was first for God. And, they, and because they weren't pursuing that, God and them, are, they, they, they bring God under judgment. And the word there is like a trial that the hammer is hit and you're condemned. Can you believe that? The children of Israel who were brought out of Egypt, brought into, a, a, soon to go into a land of milk and honey, provided for with a cloud and with a pillar, with water and food, manna. They, they, they brought, this is the second time that, that now they're without water and they bring God under a judgment and find him guilty. And in the law of Moses, uh, when you're guilty, and you know what they say he's guilty of? Bringing us out of Egypt to come into this land for us and our children and our cattle to die. So we accuse you of murder or attempted murder, and we find you guilty of attempted murder. You're trying to kill us. And, and the, the idea of attempted murder, they even actually take rocks and say, we can't throw a rock at God, but Moses, you're the closest thing we can find to him. And so they, they're, they're getting ready in their heart to stone Moses, a representative, represented in their heart of, we're ready to stone God. Have you ever seen that? It's probably in a very subtle form, that anger at God. You have not done what I wanted from you. 
You have not come through for me. You have not caused water to pour forth when I was thirsty. That longing in my heart has not been met. Well, see, God is in a place there to say to us, I want to show you your heart. Is it after things or is it after me? But here I close with this. The mercy of God, the awesomeness of God's presence is so amazing that that rock, when they came to, the, Moses, is, he sees this rock in, in the wilderness and God tells him, the Father God tells him, go up to that rock and take that, that uh, uh, staff that I have given to you to do miracles with. And what do you want him to do with that staff? Do you remember? To strike the rock. Strike the rock. Remember what we just read in, in Corinthians? Who's the rock? Christ. Christ is the rock. And the Father said to Moses, instead of killing my people, instead of, instead of destroying them as they deserve to be destroyed, instead of striking them with your rod of judgment and wrath, strike the rock. Strike the rock instead. What does this mean? It means that Christ was struck for us. That there's not one person in this room, you might have been listening to this message and saying, I think he's talking about so-and-so. Yeah, I think he's talking about the guy sitting down the road. No, we're talking about ourselves here today, aren't we? That, that all of us are in that place where we murmur and complain and grumble against God. We're not satisfied with him wholly. We want more from him. And, and instead of doing what we deserve, striking us, he struck the rock, Christ, on our behalf, saying that my anger towards you has been lifted. And in his place now, what comes out of the rock? Not wrath, not poison, not judgment, but water. Living water comes out of that rock for you and I. That living water is a taste of the glory of God. It's not just physical water. It's more than that. Remember I said it speaks to the deepest longings of our heart. And so God in his goodness says to you and I, I won't just require of you to put your idols down because that's too hard. Because, because you were meant, you were created. I put in your heart when I created you, I put in a heart to worship. And, and sometimes you attach and find yourself attached to things to worship. Money, success, power, fame. You attach your worship of those things. You actually bow down to those things and say, I'm driven by you. I'm, you're my all in all. I want you more than anything else. And if you are taken away from me, I'm going to get bitter and angry and disappointed and discouraged and depressed and maybe even leave you. And, and we could be left in that place of idolatry, worshiping the idol. But in God, rather than just saying, and he does say this because he's, he's God and he gets to say what he wants. He says, don't have any idols. Don't worship idols. Don't have any God before me. But the good news is he reveals himself. That's why Moses' words were so good. Show us your glory. You know why? Because once God's glory is shown, people tend to fall on their face before a holy, mighty, loving, powerful, good God. They tend to say, that's what I've been longing to worship my whole life. That's what I want my life to be about. The things of this world, the old song says, grow strangely dim in the light of his beholding the glory and grace of God. Uh, uh, yeah, okay, success, fine. Money, fine. Job, fine. Wife, fine. Love, kids, great. But I want God. I won't go in any of those areas without you going into those things in my life. That's what God wants for you and I. That's his heart desire for us that we would have that long ago. Stand with me if you would. Worship team, if you guys would come back. Uh, I long for you to find and walk in. I've spent two to three months now trying to proclaim to you that there's an ultimate favor. I mean, excuse me, there's an unlimited favor that God just loves to bless and bless and bless. And now I put, I believe, the capstone on it and say, yeah, but be careful with unlimited favor and blessings of God. Jeremiah says this, be careful. He warns them, be careful because in your prosperity, you might forget me. In Deuteronomy chapter eight, same thing happens. I blessed you with, with land and crops and gold and silver. You had all these things I blessed you with, but in the midst of it, you departed from my presence. And God in his goodness, if you, here, here's the good news is that all he wants to do today is restore him in his proper place as the only one worthy of your worship. There's, there's nothing else worthy. Put everything else in its proper place. Let it, what's, what's gonna happen today? Things will get diminished now. 
things you still want, still desire, still long for, still have a craving to some degree in your heart, but it'll be diminished. It won't be the, it won't be the, the power source of the energy of your life. It's not what you wake up for. Instead, you wake up for Jesus. You wake up to know his name, to have his glory revealed into your heart. And there's no better way to live your life. It's full of worship and adoration. Worship is not just music. You know that, right? Worship is not just, just singing a few songs on a Sunday morning or in a small group or at home with your guitar. It's, it's this lifestyle that I'm talking about of, of ridding your heart of things that don't belong and putting this in its place. If you desire, while the worship team gets ready to sing a song for us and we can minister to the Lord, if you desire, you're saying today, I am resolved. I will set my face like Flint, like Moses, to say, I want nothing more than your glory. I want the glory of God in my life. Maybe things have slipped to the left or to the right or things get so needy, we get so needy, we're so thirsty in our life that things begin to press ahead of that. And you're here today to say no. And in just a moment, I'm gonna open up the front of this altar just for us to pray. If you don't know Jesus, you, you gotta know him because he's the only thing worthy of worship. You're, you're missing out on real worship. You're worshiping false gods that will let you down. That's why so many people, once they receive their false gods, I wanna make a million dollars. And then they get it, they say, oh, that's not satisfying. I need to make 10 million. These false gods never satisfy. I can tell you, Jesus satisfies. He's, he's the water out of the rock. And if you want to say today, I'm going all out for that. I want not just unlimited favor of God. I want the ultimate. And I want to give my whole life. And there's a, there's a consecrated call to this. There's a decision to be made. I want my whole life to be wrapped up in this kind of worship. This kind of living it all out for God. If that's you, would you step out of your seat and join me at the front here? I'm not stepping down because it's a little hard for me. Mike jumped down. He jumps down and gets praise with you, but I, I, I have a little hard time getting down there. I'm a little bit older. So I won't join you on the front here, but if you want it, come and join us up at the front here. We're just going to pray. God, unlimited, sure, but ultimate, ultimate. Holy Spirit, just come right now. And even the Holy Spirit conviction would come into our heart and say, God, I, 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 I am prone to wander, prone to leave the God I love. And God, it's not through oftentimes uh, shaking an angry fist at you, but it's oftentimes through uh, just slightly forgetting about you, slightly letting other priorities crop up to the front. And so we're asking God for uh, uh, rectifying of that. And God, there's, there's others in this room there today, they, they want to come forward too because they're saying, he is my all in all. But I just want to confirm that today. I want to affirm that to the Father through an act of worship, not just being a song, but even stepping out of my seat, coming to the front and saying, God, you're my ultimate. You're my everything. You're my all in all. I want you more than anything else. And maybe I just want to come forward just to thank him. Say, God, I want to thank you for being the rock that was struck rather than striking me when I wandered. And even in my wandering, God, you invited me back to where that rivers of living waters flow and I can live to honor and worship you. Hallelujah. Let's just take a moment right now. And just, just deal with this in our heart. Let this be the cry of our heart. Let it, let it echo Moses' cry, show me your glory. While the worship team sings, just begin to pray over that. You still can come forward if you'd like. The altars are open. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Jesus. I'm going to ask the band to just stop playing for a moment. and just Can we just take a moment in quietness? We don't do this very often here at Springs Church, but just a moment in quietness to and it might be an examination of the heart, just saying, God, just reveal to me what words would you speak over me? And before I leave, either be this altar or this sanctuary, I would leave knowing it's finished, it's confirmed, it's confirmed that you are my all in all. You're what I seek. Isn't it wonderful? Praise you. Let me pray for us as we close. Father, ultimately, we desire for you to put 
the fullness of yourself right in front of us. Strip away everything else where it's face to face with God. Unveiled faces, no longer hid in the rock, but revealed to the rock. No longer covered with a hand or a veil, but open access to behold your glory. And I ask you, Jesus, let that move our hearts. Our stony hearts would be softened by this message. Isn't he wonderful? Yes, Jesus, we say to you today, just as we wrap things up in your presence here today, that you are wonderful, that you're above everything else, that you are God above all gods of this world and this earth. They pale in comparison. They are no gods at all. Only you, Jesus. And I ask you, Lord, would you just deliver this, not as a message, but God as a reality in our life. Deliver this unto us. Like, like getting a special delivery. It's not just somebody saying you're getting it delivered. Actually, something is put in our hand. Now put in our heart, God, a new and fresh hunger that says, I am all about the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords. Nothing else compares. God, this is a hard message to some degree to, to live out because the world crushes in on us so strongly to get our distraction. But Lord, Help us, help us this week not to be distracted. We're not asking for two weeks, three weeks. Uh, we're asking for this week, God. And then next week we're asking again, week after week. But for this week, God, these next seven days, we're asking God, help us to remember what's first and foremost in our life, and that's you and you alone. We give thanks for this in Jesus' name.